welcome back to It's an Inside Job podcast. I'm your host, Jason Lim. Now, this podcast is dedicated to helping you to help yourself and others to become more mentally and emotionally resilient so you can be better at bouncing back from life's inevitable setbacks. Now, on It's an Inside Job, we decode the science and stories of resilience into practical advice, skills, and strategies that you can use to impact your life and those around you. Now, with that said, let's slip into the stream. Well, welcome back, folks, to It's an Inside Job. I'm your host, Jason Lim. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your week. This week, we are going to hop all the way over to Israel, where we will meet today's guest, Samantha Amit. Now, Samantha's mission as a leadership coach is to introduce mindfulness tools to corporate and organizational managers, aiming to empower teams, foster resilience, and encourage strategic thinking. Now, Samantha coaches in over 30 countries, experiencing alongside her clients the complexities and high demands that managers face daily. Having worked under such pressure for 20 years in a senior management position with international software companies, well, Samantha's personal transformation with mindfulness tools ignited her passion for bringing conscious leadership training to companies and organizations. Witnessing her clients undergo transformation as well, Samantha developed the Mindful Leadership Digital Course. Now, this online program provides managers and corporate leaders, regardless of their location, access to the Mindful ACT Leadership Model, now ACT for ACT, for incorporating mindfulness into their work and personal lives. The framework challenges and encourages individuals to think and act purposely, making meaningful impact with their teams, across teams, and within the broader ecosystem. And this is what we talk about today. We go deep into the woods, looking at what mindfulness from a practitioner's point of view. We're going to get very nuts and bolts here, very concrete. So now let's slip into the stream and meet Samantha Amit. Samantha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jason. I was wondering if we can kick off the conversation by you introducing who you are and what you do. So, hi everybody, nice to meet you, Um, listening in. I'm Samantha Amit, I grew up in South Africa. I have been living um, in the Middle East, I live in Israel for the last 27 years. And I'm a leadership coach, I'm a mindfulness practitioner. And uh, mindfulness forms a huge part of my work and of my life. I was wondering, maybe we could start there and understand what mindfulness is. Perhaps you could sort of operationally define it, how mindfulness shows up in your business and how you work when you work with organizations and leaderships or as a coach. Yeah, thanks for the question. So mindfulness is has been defined by John Kabat-Zinn, who's one of my teachers and mentors, as a you know, present moment awareness purposely. And the purposely is very important and not judgmentally. Hmm. And so um, so it's really been awake in your life from moment to moment with purpose. So our, our brain tends to wonder. Uh, we know from research that 50% of the time our brains are on automatic pilot and they wander around. And so mindfulness is a practice that we have to intentionally bring into our day and bring into our moment to be purpose, purposefully present. It's very much needed in, um, in leadership today. And so I have specific ways that I practice it that I'd love to share uh, during our interview today. Yeah, sure. So to dive a little deeper, what do you mean by purposely present? I know present in the here and now, but is it to actively be cognizant that right now I need to be present with myself with whatever's going on? Is that what you mean or is it an extended definition? For sure, there's an extended definition. So with mindfulness, there's your inner experience, what's going on for you within. What's going on with you within is what's what's happening with my thoughts right now? Where's my mind? How are my emotions? What am I feeling right now? And what's going on in my body? The more we're aware of um, what's going on for us internally, I like to call it our internal landscape or the weather within, 
the more it can actually give us um, so much ability to be better as a leader, to, to show up better in our connections with our direct reports. And so uh, mindfulness is, first of all, an inner experience of what's going on for me within and for me to be able to pay attention to that. So it's that paying attention to what's going on with, within, but it doesn't stop there. It's also what's going on, like, like me noticing what's going on with you and, you know, the outer experience as well. So the reason why I asked you is I, I noticed your hand going up while you were speaking to me and I thought you were asking me to pause. So that's that's what made me ask before. What I love about mindfulness is that whenever you meet yourself, first of all, you meet something new. Because, you know, energy is shifting all the time. Everything's changing. So you never meet the same thing. And it's been a it's been such a wonderful journey to, you know, unpack being more mindful in the moment and coaching leaders to be more mindful. Uh, it grows actually courage, which is something that only recently I've really noticed because a lot of the leaders that I'm coaching, I use mindfulness within the coaching sessions in order to actually kind of give them the experience and then they start using it as well in, in their life. And so um, it builds courage because if you stop for any moment into, <clears throat> let's say you drop into stillness, which is one of the mindfulness practices, it's like a meditation, you're going to notice, you're going to notice your internal state. So you'll notice your thinking, you'll notice, you know, maybe emotions or what's going on in your body. And some people don't like that. And so it's hard to stop and notice your thinking, especially if it's negative thinking. Mm. But it's the biggest actually gift we can get, give ourselves because the minute we start noticing that, that's when we actually can self-correct, when we can self-regulate. And um, so for me, mindfulness is like ABC of life, of living. It's, it's like truly... Truly being awake to life. And obviously, you're not going to be mindful every moment because our minds tend to drift. But the more we can access that, the more we can bring it into the present moment, then we really have more control over our life because we're noticing what's going on within. And then we can choose in the moment and say, okay, what now? Okay, so I want to get a little more nuts and bolts here, Samantha. So I'm going to challenge you here. So as you said, you know, what's happening internally, as you described it, is an internal weather system. And that internal weather system will shift. I mean, depending upon, it's very situational. So what would you say the aspects of the internal weather system is? You said it's thoughts, emotions, and I guess it's some physical sensations that we may be feeling. Are there other elements to this internal weather system that people in this practice of stillness become aware of? Mm -hmm. So what I was referring to is when I said the internal weather system, I was referring to a check-in that I do. So it's a mindfulness mm -hmm. practice that I do that uh, almost like a little method that we check in. I have an online course. And so within the online course, we start every day with this check-in. And it's like a you can do it in 30 seconds where you really – scan what my thinking is, what's, you know, going on in my heart, what's going on in my body. And so these aren't the only aspects, but this is like one way that you can practice mindfulness. And so um, it's like, a you know, one, two, three, scan your thinking, scan your, your emotions, scan what's going on in your body so that you can get like a pulse mm -hmm. on how am I right now? So I won't say it's the only aspects, but it's it's a start. Because another thing you said is that mindfulness is being present, it's being to the here and now and sort of understand what's going on in an internal environment as you just kind of articulated. Mm -hmm. And when the mind is kind of wandering, for me, from a neuroscience perspective, that's something they've discovered called the default mode network. And that's when we can sometimes get wrapped up in ourselves. How's the world affecting me? How What's my what's my uh relationship with everything around me and we're not cognizant to this this is just that's why they call it the default network right it just kind of right. comes back to in that but a lot of the times 
especially if we are in a stressed or a conflicted state, that can drive anxiety, that can de drive depression, that can drive negative thinking or rumination or overthinking. Is this something you experience as a mindfulness coach? Not yourself, but with clients? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Absolutely. This is exactly what I experience. John kabat again, who I'm repeating his name because he really brought mindfulness to the Western world. Mm -hmm. And and so he wrote a book, I think it's called uh, Wherever You Go, There You Are. And basically the idea of the book is that you're going to meet yourself according to however you are in the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. It's really okay because if you're meeting yourself, then you can practice the different aspects of mindfulness, which you, we, we started speaking about purposely because mindfulness is, you know, it's huge. There's, there, there are layers to it. So the attitudes that you can bring, like, for example, you can uh, bring compassion in. So let's say you meet that anxiety. Let's say you meet that anxious state because you've stopped and you paused for a moment. What can you do to regulate yourself? to bring yourself back to center. And so mindfulness is actually not about fixing yourself. It's not about, um, it's not about being happy all the time because what we know is that happiness comes and goes. And so it's not about any expectation, but just actually the simple practice of meeting yourself where you are right now and, and just noticing that. And then that's the check-in. And then you can say, okay, now what? Mm. Let's say you meet anxiety. Let's say you meet overwhelm. What for you, like the person listening to us now, what helps you? So for some people to get back to center, it may be, you know, um, going for a walk, getting into nature. Um, it may be, you know, watching a movie just to distract from that stress, to get out of that rumination, which happens to some of us when we get very anxious. So I think it's very helpful, first of all, the mindfulness piece is just to meet ourselves where we are. And then, okay, from there, then, then I could bring in the coaching aspect, which we were both coaches, is mm. what can we do now? Um, what, what can we do? Or what do we want to do with what we've just noticed? We could be high energy. We could be, you know, um, we have, have a lot of energy. And then we could say, okay, I'm noticing this in me now. Maybe the task that I was planning to do right now, I could postpone for later because I have all this energy. Maybe... It's the energy now for, for doing sales calls for, you know, something specific. Maybe I'm feeling very focused because I, I, I drop into silence. I do a meditation practice and I'm noticing how clear my brain is, mm -hmm. how focused I'm feeling. And it's a really good feeling. So when I notice that, I can tap into it and change my calendar because I very much coach leaders in the moment to be adaptive. And how we can be adaptive is, first of all, noticing what's going on for us right now mm. and saying, okay, what do I need? Or what do I want to choose? That's that intentionality. What do I choose now in the moment? And so very much, very much like for team leaders and people leading multiple teams to do this kind of practice before they go into a meeting, for example. Mm. So what I find really interesting, Samantha, is that, as you said, you know, mindfulness can become a practice. It's something you can build as a routine. For example, get up in the morning and the first thing you do is sit with yourself, do a stillness practice and understand what's going on. Just checking in with yourself. Now, we've talked about rumination and overthinking, you're saying. And as you said, it's to be adaptive in the moment. Let's say someone's at work going about their day and all of a sudden they get some hard news. Something's gone wrong. Something's gone, got derailed. And all of a sudden, they go down the rumination tunnel. They go down the rabbit hole. And like most of us, 
if we haven't trained, we continue down that rabbit hole and all of a sudden we're in a warren of tunnels and we can't find our way out. But how does someone in that moment pull themselves out to become present of the narrative that they're telling themselves, to become present of what's going on in their internal environment? Because for me, that has always been one of the most difficult nuts to crack. If you have a routine, yeah, six o'clock in the morning, this is what I do, fine, it's you, you you have a scheduled time for that. But in, mm-hmm. as you said, adaptive in the moment, I just like to explore that. How yeah. do you encourage someone yeah. to kind of yeah, yeah. Yeah, be yeah. present? So it's a brilliant, brilliant question. Mm. First of all, anybody listening, I want to encourage you to start somewhere. So you need to have a mindfulness practice or some kind of practice to be able to catch yourself in those moments where you derail. And so... To expect yourself to be able to come back to center where you don't have practices, it's so much harder. So it's much easier, first of all, to practice when things are quieter, when life is a bit easier than when you're in a storm. And I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to your, uh, to answer your question, but I just want to give a little bit of background. So it's important to have, uh, you know, as part of your daily habits, let's call it some habits that help you uh, uh, calibrate what's going on with yourself that you first of all notice that you've derailed. So you can call it a mindfulness pulse. You can call it a check-in because as you say, we often don't notice that we've derailed. So people that like to work with checklists and I work with highly effective, highly, you know, high achievers. And so it really helps to have systems in place because when you have systems in place, then you can tap into something. So let's even talk about something as simple as a checklist. Mm -hmm. The minute you have a checklist, you can have a number of different ideas of what you can do when you have derailed. So one of the things that's really helpful is the minute you notice you've derailed is to know what helps you. So Jason, Mm -hmm. you are different to me. What helps me is not going to help you. And maybe it will, but what I like to do with my clients is help them to learn more about themselves and help them help their team members. You know, we've all got all the spectrum of colors. We all are similar, but we're also different. And so if we can create for ourselves and know ourselves to know what works for us, that's really, that's what makes us, you know, like top leaders, Because we know ourselves well. We know how when we derail to get us back, but then we need to have systems in place to know we've even derailed. And sometimes we do want to sit in the misery. We want to sit in the rumination of whatever. And that's also okay. But give yourself a time limit. What often helps is is, um, getting together with somebody else. Sometimes we can't regulate by ourselves when we've derailed. Hmm. So it helps having a coach, having a therapist, having a mentor, having a resonant colleague that you know can be there for you with whatever you're going through. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can be something small and can be something big. But for you, it is, um, it's enough that it's derailed you. And, and so having systems in place, understanding. So what I understand, Samantha, is like, it's, underst- it's to understand how you react in certain situations and what that means for you. It's sitting with your emotions to understand what those emotions are communicating to you so you're better able to deal with the information because it may just be misinformation. You may be over-reading or overcooking the situation. But what I also hear is that by doing this, by having a backup system, when you feel you're derailed because you've, you've been present with yourself, then it becomes much more easier to walk yourself back from the abyss or back from the edge. Is that what I understand? So it, exactly. it's about in good times is to be mindful of how you are or a little stressful times, low hanging fruit. So when the crisis or the tsunami hits, the maelstrom hits, we've already prepared. Is that what I understand? Absolutely. And I, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, anybody that's listening, mm. um, we're calling this mindfulness, but call it whatever you want. 
just have systems in place to support you. We want to, as leaders, always be challenging ourselves to grow ourselves and to grow our team and to grow the business. On the other side, we want to have systems in place that can support us when we derail, when we go off center, when we feel bad. And the thing is, if we can bring that, if we can get back to center quicker, we all gonna derail, that's normal, that's human nature. So I just wanna give you an example of my own practice. Please. I won't go into the why, but I used to walk around Jason angry for a whole week. Can you imagine carrying anger within you for a week? Now, anger doesn't start with anger. It starts with frustration or annoyance or disappointment or hurt, and it quickly turns to anger. And what happens is holding that in my body, it's not a nice way to live because I could, on the outside, be, you know, I was passive aggressive. So on the inside, I was holding all that anger. On the outside, everybody thought, oh, I was great. I was a superwoman. And I brought this anger back home into my home. Mm. And I had two small kids. And I just, you know, I didn't have patience for them. So that's mindfulness builds patience. And so I knew that was my story. I had to change myself because I was actually a great leader. But at the end of the day, I just did, I couldn't contain myself anymore. I didn't have patience for two young kids because I didn't have help at home. My husband was also in high tech. I was in high tech. And so that's how I came to mindfulness. And then, so I was in, I was in high tech in, in software for many years and then Eventually, I realized how much, you know, mindfulness has supported me, and I realized I need to make this change. So that's why I became a coach, and I need to make this change to help others as well. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether you have anger for three hours. That's three hours that you're suffering. And so what if you can bring that down from three hours to two hours to one hour to half an hour? Anybody that's listening in that has a tendency to get angry, first of all, anger is a good emotion. We, we want to be angry. We want to have all the range of emotions. So when we are checking in with ourselves and we notice that we're angry, great, that's fantastic. And we can breathe into that and notice, okay, what's happened? Because when we're angry, we often are, are mindless. Like we are in that, that like, it's almost like being in, in you know, like in, in, in the water, being in, in mm. you know, like almost like drowning. We don't even realize it. And so if we have these check-ins during the day, as you named it, to have the full range of mm. emotions, start noticing what I'm really feeling, what emotion is present, then we can start saying, okay, what actually happened? And we can start tracking our day. What happened? Like, why, why am I feeling like this? And mindfulness isn't about fixing it you can decide yeah I don't, I don't want to be angry anymore let me see what I want to do about it but first of all notice what's going on and then you have these systems in place and then which help you come back to center so because I practice and I have this practice that I practice my practice is sitting every day for 30 minutes but for somebody else they may not be able to sit so maybe it's going yoga maybe it's journaling there's so many things you can do to notice what's going on, what's your internal state like, because the more you're aware of yourself, the more you manage better, the more you show up as a better leader, the more you can empower and encourage your team. Yeah, I just want to come back to the anger because I agree with you. Anger is a good emotion if used right. You know, what I for any intense emotion is like trying to keep an intense weather system that's not going to happen. Like an intense anger, it rises and falls pretty fast, right? But what I hear, what you're saying that got you into mindfulness, Samantha, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it was sort of this low simmering anger. It's just kind of cooking away for a week, for a day. And as you said, you could handle things on, you just get up, you would work professionally, you could handle things that was going on. But at the end of the day, you're at your end of your tether, 
and there was not much you're just kind of burning on fumes and then two little kids are demanding like any other human being we would collapse under that weight but what i hear what you're saying is that anger there's anger in and there's anger out this is what a neuroscience scientist taught me a while back he says anger in tends to be that 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 anger that sits with us and just gnaws at us because we don't really do anything with it but anger out it becomes a vessel it cleans the vessel because anger out is when you take that frustration or that agitation as you said and you do something about the situation constructively of course constructively to deal with the situation where you use the anger in an outwards manner to as a tool to deal with the circumstances in a, in a constructive way or as constructive as you can. Because I understand like low simmering anger. I think everyone's experienced that where it just kind of eats and grinds at us. Is this, have I kind of got what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what I, you know, fully agree with you is that we want to be able to have all the emotions particularly anger, because anger can tell us that we're in conflict with something mm. that's happened. You know, it could be a, um, a relational, could be a task conflict. Hopefully uh, it's a task and not relational conflict. <laughs> mm. But um, so it, it really helps us to understand uh, that we've been triggered. Mm. And so, again, the check-in to just notice, oh, I've been triggered, and then what? Now what? And I think that's very important what you said, because anger, as you said, if we get off center or if we get off kilter, just knowing that we're kind of starting to get agitated and irritated, if we have practiced this, if we've created these support systems, as you said, mm -hmm. then these these uncomfortable emotions actually become the trigger for us to address like, OK, something I've derailed here and I'll just continue derailing unless I deal with this. Yeah, and, and so I want to take the conversation actually into a, a new direction because you've inspired me. Okay. What I want everybody to know on the call today is if we all know what our values are and we live in our integrity by our values, many of the times you will uh, 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 be mindful just by practicing that, by being living your values every day. Now, we don't want to come back to center. We want to use the anger when there's a situation that is not okay. So let's take an example. Um, let's say you're a manager and you're leading your team and something goes on in another team. Let's say uh, uh, somebody's speaking about one of your team members and, and, and it's even been rudely, maybe even an email goes off um, you know, blaming, okay? There's blame, let's say, in the culture, and they're blaming your, one, of, one of your great team, team members. Mm. And a leader's role, first of all, is to back up and look after their team. That's their number one. And so if a leader actually does get triggered by that, that's really good because it's, it's normal. So you get triggered, you notice that immediately. And then that leader's role, they can use the anger to approach whoever wrote that email and say, that is not okay. And you use your tone and you tell them quite directly, that is not going to happen again. You have a problem, you come and speak to me. And so we want to use the anger. And if you don't, and if you don't um, uh, uh, live in your integrity, if you don't back up your, your team members, which is your number one role as a leader, mm. You're not going to feel equanimity. You're not going to feel well-being because you're going to not, you know, be living in your integrity. You're not going to be using your strengths as a leader. I think it comes back to what you said. You know, when you have an emotional, you know, you, you can't stop emotions. Emotions just arise based upon what triggers you. And you, you can't stop it. So it arises. But I think what you said, Samantha, is that you need to be present. You need to notice what you're feeling and understand Okay, this is what I'm feeling. I think just in that in itself is just asking yourself that one simple question. What am I feeling right now? And then what's triggered this emotion? What that does, that puts you on top of the emotion. So instead of the emotions ruling you, you are ruling the emotions because you're using that, those emotions as information to make more cognizant choices or decisions to constructively deal with a conflict, a situation, 
uh, a conundrum, what have you. So I, I, I think that's so important to understand that emotions, you know, there's just information, but what do you want to do with that information? If it's, if it's crap or misinformation, then maybe put it aside and gather more facts. Yes, yes, yes. In the first part of the conversation with Samantha, she provides a comprehensive understanding of mindfulness, defining it as a purposeful and non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. She underscores the importance of acknowledging and exploring our thoughts, emotions, and bodily sensations, emphasizing that encountering oneself in various situations leads to the discovery of new facets of one's identity. Samantha also discusses the fluidity of our mindset, emphasizing that it constantly evolving in response to external circumstances and life events. This recognition serves as a foundation for her approach to mindfulness, where individuals are encouraged to observe and accept their mental states without judgment. Now, the concept of self-compassion emerges as a central theme as Samantha prompts individuals to inquire, what can you do to regulate yourself back to center? This question reflects a commitment to nurturing a compassionate relationship with ourselves, particularly during challenging moments. Now, the emphasis is not on fixing inherent flaws or achieving constant happenings, but on cultivating a mindful awareness of one's current state. Now, moreover, Samantha highlights the significance of managing crisis through systematic training. She advocates for the development of a structured approach to mindfulness, which can be honed in simple everyday moments. Now, the idea is to establish a habitual mindfulness practice that can be readily applied in times of crisis, enabling us to navigate challenges with greater resilience and clarity. Now, using the example of anger, Samantha illustrates how emotions can serve as signals, indicating a connection with certain aspects of our experience. Rather than succumbing or to suppressing our emotions, she, instead, she encourages individuals to consider how they want to respond to these signals. This proactive approach empowers us to choose mindful, intentional responses to our emotions, fostering emotional intelligence and well-being. So now let's slip back into the stream in part two of my conversation with Samantha Amit. You were talking about values, you know, and coming back to your values. And we, we talk about values in corporations all the time and organizations. But if we come back to our personal values, are there certain exercises you do as a mindfulness coach with the with your clientele to help them discover their values? Yeah, thank you for the question. So there are a number of ways, um, there are a number of exercises that um, many coaches use. Uh, a classic exercise is to um, go and actually interview people that are really close to you because they'll know you and they'll know what your top values are. Uh, so you can do that. What I like to do also when I'm in a coaching session with uh, someone, you notice their values by their, their stories they tell. Um, you notice, you know, who, um, who has a value of support or who has a value of responsibility. Um, and, and, and if there's somebody that's ambition and, you know, we have, we, within ourselves, by the way, we have a conflict uh, uh, within our own value system. So, uh, somebody may have a value of ambition, but they may also have a value of family. And so those often come into conflict. And when you just check in, you notice that. You notice that there's, let's give a classic example. Uh, I have a call at the end of the day that all the senior managers are going to be on. Let's say it's at 7 p.m. That's dinner time. That's dinner time in our family. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we try not to be on those calls. And so leaders have this all the time. I mean, we're living, you know, uh, Everybody's working in cross teams that I work with leaders in 30 different countries. They're all working in cross teams. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, three different continents uh, easily, three to five different continents. And so time zones is a big issue and that causes a lot of triggers. Know what your top values are. Know that we get triggered ourselves. No one else on the outside. We get triggered by our own values because I want, I am ambitious. I want to be on that call. It's a chance for me to show up as a leader to contribute. Maybe that's important for me to contribute. 
And at the same time, maybe, you know, uh, I have a family dinner. Maybe it's even, Mm -hmm. I don't know, an occasion, a birthday of somebody. How can I miss that? You know, and so you have this whole internal struggle going on. And so you breathe, you notice what's going on. Then you need to choose. You need to choose, okay, am I going to be on that call or am I going to show up, uh, uh, you know, at the birthday party? Sometimes you can't do both. And so mindfulness is about being present with that inner struggle and also knowing that you can choose. And then as a coach, what I encourage, uh, you know, my, the leaders that I'm coaching is to be okay with your choice. Because can you imagine that you choose to show up, let's say, on the meeting, and then you feel really bad about not being at the birthday party? It's okay also to feel bad and to bring compassion into that. But it's difficult. It's difficult to be human. So no, never I, mind yeah. what's going on with everybody else. A lot of the stuff comes from within us. You know, it, it comes full circle. It's about mindfulness, being present, noticing what you're feeling. Because I think the clash of values is a thing that constantly comes up in a complex life. You know, sometimes when I ha- I'm working with managers and they need to give feedback, like hard feedback to an employee or maybe to a colleague across the departments, right? That they're sitting uh, sitting at the same level is that they may have a clash. They want to be honest, but at the same time, they want to be benevolent. And they think, if I'm honest, then I can't be benevolent, right? And, and I'm raw, I, I might be ruining the, um, the, 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 the relationship or I'm going to you know, put holes in it at least. So a lot of the times they will choose to be nice and benevolent and not really address the issue, honesty. And that's a clash of values. But in our conversations by being present, I don't call it mindfulness per se, but it's just, okay, tell me what's going on, right? It's just being in the here and now, but same vernacular, uh, just different vernacular, same terms, sorry. But what I get them to do, Samantha, I said, okay, look, you have this clash of values between being nice and being honest. What is the reason? They are usually in the short term. If I say this, if I'm honest with them, it's going to hurt their feelings. But if we pull out by using the information that they're feeling, this clash of values, then all of a sudden what we see is that, okay, if we take the long-term perspective, yes, in the short term, it'll cause some level of social pain. But in the long term, you're actually strengthening the relationship because he or she trusts you and understands you're coming with good intentions. And so this can also disentangle this clash of values sometimes by shifting perspective. But the only way to be able to do that is to be aware, to be self-aware of what's going on. That, that's just mine because I, I, I like your exactly, example. Exactly, of, obviously of exactly. dinner so, dinner with the kids or meeting with the, the, the team, right, at the exact same right. time. And I, just just a, I had another point here, but it's about trade-offs. I don't. I think if people disregard the idea of trying to strike a balance, it, there's no way you can strike a balance in a complex moving life with two, so many moving parts. Sometimes you need to make the choice. Today, I have to be at this meeting because of blah, blah, blah. Or today, I'm going to be at my kid's football practice and because I promised him I'd be there. And they're just going to have to get get on with the business and then contact me afterwards, right? It's trade-offs. And if you're, if you're good with that to some extent, it makes life a lot easier to move through. Right. So some people, that comes naturally to them. Mm-hmm. And um, good for you if that's easy for you. For a lot of people, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. So if we do have listeners that it is hard for them, you know, these just tough decisions that we need to make and these choices that we need to make, know that there are many people like you. Mm. And so, uh, as you mentioned, it's it's really important to know that it's part of life, but part of the mindfulness practice is to actually be compassionate with yourself. So what we want to do is we take it a level higher is when we notice that we are hurting because we needed to choose mm. and both choices are hard then there are, again, you can have, okay, I won't say a checklist, but you can have things that you know about yourself that help you. So first of all, like what helped me to always say, I'm doing the best I can. Mm. That always, that mantra always helped me because 
I often felt that I was failing as a mom. I felt I wasn't good enough. So I always had the sentence, I'm not good enough. Hmm. And, and so when I noticed that and I noticed, uh, you know, the, um, the pain within, um, the sadness within, even the depression within, of feeling, you know, I wish I could be a better mom and I'm not. I, I, I kept telling myself, you, when I noticed that you're doing the best you can, Sam, and then bring practicing compassion because we need to learn to love ourselves. The world is a hard place to be in. And so we first have to nurture ourselves, love ourselves, bring the attention back in, be soft with ourselves. Because usually the perfectionists that I coach and the high achievers, they're very hard with themselves. They push themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. And so in order to become a better leader, you need to find that soft, you need to have the yin and yang. You need to find that place where you can actually bring the intention back to you and say, you know, I wish it could be any other way, but I'm choosing this and it's really hard for me. That really resonates with me. And, you know, I'm also curious to dive into, you have what's called a mindful act leadership model, ACT. I was wondering, maybe could you walk us through that and what that means? Because I think that's a good segue from what you were just talking about. Right. So I'll do that. Um, I do want to encourage you as you're listening to me, because I can see how mindful you are and how, just by the way, to the listeners again, listening is a mindfulness practice. Don't have to meditate. All you need to do is really, really listen to the people you work with, to your family members, to anybody in conversation. That's a practice because often when we're listening, we listen, um, we listen to see what we're going to be asking or what we're going to be saying. And uh, so first I want to encourage you, Jason, that when you're listening to me and you see parallels, I do want you to share them. So as we're moving forward in the conversation, I think we have time. I'd like to hear your parallels because I think it will help the listeners. Sure, will do. Because we'll do. everybody sees things and hears things differently. So maybe they'll resonate actually not with what I'm saying in particular, but maybe what you say. So especially if there's something in parallel to share that. Will do, will do. Okay. So the Mind for Act Leadership Model. So this comes from uh, an online program that I have. So I wrote a book with uh, Professor Passmore in 2017. We wrote a book together on mindfulness at work. And the reason I wrote the book was because it's a very practical book with exercises in and uh, to help leaders within organizations to actually practice mindfulness. But then I realized that uh, in COVID-19 that, again, many people were struggling. So I realized I wanted to get this act model out even more so to the world and people were learning digitally mm. and also a lot of companies didn't have money to invest in face-to-face -face learning so I took the act model and I wrapped it up in a two-month online program and so how the program works is act actually stands for ACT stands for achieve connect and thrive and why it's called ACT is because you need to do something. To be mindful is anything but passive. To practice mindful, anything, any mindful exercise, even to listen, okay, we said that's a mindful exercise. Mm. That's an ACT. You have to purposely, we're getting again into the definition, you have to purposely listen because within your mind, okay, there's a, inner chatter going on, you know, about, and so you have to learn to let go. Let go, by the way, is one of the mindfulness attitudes. You have, want to let go. And again, bring yourself into the listening. So if I a little bit break down the act, the ACT, please. the chief part is about me and myself. That's what we've primarily been speaking about. It's about listening to my inner world it's about noticing what triggers me it's about me it's about how can I challenge myself to be a better leader about going out of my comfort zone 15 percent which what we do as coaches we challenge our leaders and about also managing our stress so that's the mm. chief part then the C is all about connections because in any day, we're interacting whether asynchronously or synchronously, we are interacting with human beings all the time. 
And so those are the one-to-one -one and the one-to-many connections we have. And how can we use mindfulness to um, have better relationships, really? And one-to-one -one and one-to-many, so it's me and my team. Yeah. And it's me and my relationships with my direct reports. And I'm just going to give one more thing and then we'll, we'll go in. And then the T is the hardest part. That's the thrive. And that's a we mentality. So when I'm triggered and I'm, you know, I'm triggered, I'm often triggered because of either past trauma or something to do with my ego, my experience, or because of my values. Like there are many different reasons I'll be triggered. And so I often go into a me mentality, me, 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 he did that to me, she did that to me. Why is this happening to me that I've got, you know, this party and, and this call? Why is it on the same day? You know, it's all about me. And then I get really zoomed in with my thinking and my behavior and my feelings. And the T the is the opposite. The T is really when you grow as a leader mm. that you can move into the space of the we mentality. It's systemic thinking. It's thinking about the multiple stakeholders that you're managing, thinking about your ecosystem, thinking about the community that you're living in, thinking about the culture and the organization and how you can influence it. It's thinking not only about me and my team and my KPIs, but how can I actually grow the business? So on the simplest, simplest form, it's saying, okay, it's getting out of my team's KPIs, which is the connection piece, and getting into what will really serve the business and serve our customers from a leadership point of view. So achieve is about me and myself. It's about listening to my inner world, understanding what's going on in my internal environment. So that's that's a very focused on me. And then you have connect. And this is a little this is where the shift, the transition between we, as you said, it's connecting with other team, my team members, understanding how we communicate, collaborate, and cooperate per se, and being cognizant to that and to enhance those things that are working and improve those things that are not working. And then when you talk about thrive. This is a full full throttle in towards we, but it's looking not just at the team, but how the team's connected to the organization, how it's connected to our clients or how it's connected to the greater ecosystem. Right. That's the that's this is that's really where we are are looking at the well-being of you know the people around yeah. us where we're able to actually care about everybody's equilibrium. Um, where we are able to create resilient cultures mm. and also serve people better. And so this T piece is something that's developed and you mm. develop it also in time. And it can be developed when you are involved in social impact projects where you're getting out of Another way to develop it, so social impact projects where you, you actually get out of what's happening like in my world and my team and my business, but how can our company actually serve and help the people maybe in our town, in our village, in our city, uh, maybe something that's cross-team? How can we support, you know, leaders in, in, in other countries? And so it's getting out of this, you know, the small space and getting into like the wider space and seeing how we can contribute to a better society, how we can be in our integrity. Because if you're working for a full profit, the company needs to make a profit to be in existence. So you need to, you need to be thinking of that. How are we going to grow the business as a leader? And what we want to do also is for our team leaders to be thinking of it. I coach a lot of, a lot of engineers and so they're very analytical, very techni technical thinking. And so to grow that side of them is beautiful to help them get out of their technical subject matter expertise and actually in to be able to be much more socially equipped that way when they grow into team leaders and into leading multiple teams, they, they grow that piece. And so um, this thrive piece, I call it thrive instead of surviving, is it, it's a wonderful pace to be because even when the company is going through a storm and like now we're in difficult times, there's a lot of layoffs. Uh, people are nervous about, you know, the, um, you know, losing their jobs. 
if you can show up every day and not only think about be worried about yourself and losing, you know, what's going on for yourself, but actually have that ability to stretch and think about, you know, my colleagues think about, you know, okay, how am I going to show up fully today to grow the business, put fear aside and be my best self, that my team show up resilient, that my team can show up in their best way, that the cross teams can show up in their best way. We can do our best job to, to grow the business also in times of uncertainty. That, that's like true resilience. The achieve part, that's, I can see that being the heart of mindfulness where you're actively engaging, understanding what your thought processes are, what your emotions are, what the narratives you're telling us yourselves. But in the coaching sense, when you're working with Connect and Thrive, Samantha, is that obviously it's mindfulness, but it's not sitting in a quiet room for 30 minutes, what I understand, but it sounds like it's an active and engaging conversation, how to create the better co context of connection and thriving. I'll give you a couple of things I do with my, with, with, with the people I coach mm -hmm. and, and these same team leaders do it also with with within their team meetings but maybe before i go there i do want to comment on something that you said that's really important please to be okay with the discomfort and then i'm going to go with the second question so it's so important today for us to be okay with discomfort because that's actually being resilient there are always going to be emotional storms physical storms of all different kinds and so we definitely need to learn ways to cope better. Things have always been challenging throughout time. Mm. And if anything, they're going to get more complicated now with, you know, with generative AI, AI coming in. Um, you know, people are all trying to hop on and learn and everything. But so there's going to, we don't know what, what's coming. And actually, if we can embrace this uncertainty, it's the biggest gift we can give ourselves. And in a way, you practice that when you practice a mindful check-in, because when you stop for 30 seconds, you don't know who you're going to meet until you sit in silence, or if you want to walk in silence, you walk slowly, you can do mindfulness walking. I have that on my YouTube channel as well. And then you can walk slowly. If you can't sit still, you know, a lot of us can't sit still. You walk, but when you walk, you get in touch with what's going on within me. And when you're brave enough to actually do that, you become brave enough to actually weather any storm on the outside because we have to. We don't have a choice, actually. Uh, just to challenge you, as you said, you know, it's to be with yourself and to meet yourself and to see who that person is. But some people can get so trapped up in the rumination and the the overthinking and the anxiety ridden thoughts that to use mindfulness as a practice can actually be a slippery slope into the abyss instead of pulling it out. So I guess there are certain times where you will need a mindfulness practitioner some, such as yourself who is very skilled to help them walk through it. Because sometimes from my experience, I used to work with trauma. Sometimes I know that some people don't want to go where their thoughts go. How do you see that in what you were just saying, yeah, explaining to me? Right. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And it's really important for those people that are listening to understand where they're at. Mm -hmm. So I'm a mindfulness-based stress reduction practitioner, MBSR. I recommend anybody that's listening to do an MBSR course. It's an eight-week course. Again, it's what John Kabat-Zinn, um, you know, created. And you can do these online. If you can do them in person, much better to do it in person. This is an eight-week course. And then what? Well, how that helps is you actually, you, you start practicing mindfulness every day. So you practice mindfulness every day during the course, and then you meet once a week. And so you have, again, you have a system in place. You have a structure to learn, to practice mindfulness, to meet yourself. There's another um, slight variation of it called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy where you have therapists that are, are, are actually trained in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And again, if you are in a situation that you can't stop for 30 seconds to meet yourself, probably you need help of some outside, either a coach or a, a, you know, a therapist. Mm -hmm. So definitely, we don't need to suffer. 
if you need help, find somebody that can help you. You know, really, that's what I I decided I'd suffered enough. I didn't want to suffer anymore. And now that's why I moved into coaching because I wanted to help people prevent prevent suffering by having tools in place. So to answer your question, it's very hard when you are ruminating on an ongoing basis to all of a sudden embrace mindfulness. You definitely need some kind of a, probably a, you know, a therapist, a trained therapist to help you to find ways to actually get out of that rumination. Because what we want to do when you're ruminating, it's like, you know, you those old records that you used to have and they get stuck. That's what happens when we ruminate. And so you get stuck in the same place. So if you notice your thinking, and it happens to me, I'll give you an example of when it happens to me. I can watch a bad movie and I wake up the next day and I actually notice my thoughts thinking and thinking about the movie the whole time. Sometimes it's also a good movie, by the way, and I just notice myself ruminating about a good movie. And it, it, it actually sometimes, even today, like it, it upsets me when I notice my mind is going over and over and over and over. This That's rumination. It could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. Um, it's and like so, when you get a song stuck in your head too. <laughs> so if it's okay if it stays for five minutes, let's say 10 minutes, but if you notice that you keep coming back to it mm. and it's stopping you from being productive or you're not showing up as your best self, then for sure you need a way mm. to meet that in a new way, in a better way. So um, my practices that I do with, uh, with my clients start with 30 seconds, can be a minute, and so it's much easier. Like if you're going to train for a marathon, you can't all of a sudden run a half marathon or run the 40 kilometers. You start where you're at. Mm. So if you can run 5Ks, great. You know, maybe for you starting is going and buying the right running shoes, putting your clothes out the night before that you are going to get up and, and, and run before work. So everybody starts where they can and you build on it. You build on it and you build. And, and that's, by the way, how the MBSR course starts. That's my online course as well. That's where we start. And we start somewhere and you just keep at it. So if I bring us back to the trail ahead of this conversation uh, about ACT, a is is sort of uh, the classic mindfulness, if we can call it that, where you sit with yourself and you understand what's going on in the internal environment. But C and T, um, connect and thrive, these are more active conversations with you where you ask them questions to be more present, but they try to understand sort of as they move and migrate more into the me, uh, sorry, the we territory. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. So what I actually do in a coaching session is, as I mentioned before, I take somebody into a mindfulness practice. So I ground them. I ask them. A lot of them love it. Okay. I had one client in, you know, uh, in the past that actually was, he wasn't, uh, it wasn't for him. But most of my clients actually ask for it. And I don't do it like, let's say, at the beginning of the call or at the mm. end of the call. It comes up naturally. And then what I do is I ground them and then we, you, instead of asking them to answer questions like I am with you now, I actually ask them to think of the question. So I take them through like a visualization. So I ask them questions and I put them in to the situation, what they want to, whatever's coming up for them. So let's say, for example, I'm preparing a leader for, I did this recently, a, a leader um, um, okay, so what's happening is in, in a particular uh, organization, somebody's resigned. And um, so there's a lot of talking going on in the team. And so it's a big team. The team is 30 people. And so, so what I did is I prepared the, the leader that I was coaching how he was going to hold the space for this leader that was leading, there's a lot of fear in the system because she has a lot of knowledge and they don't have anybody to replace her. There's a big gap and they have clients to serve. And so what we worked on is instead of him actually going and, and, and speaking to the whole team in like a all team hands call, I actually worked with him because that same day he had a, he had a call with his direct reports. 
So he had five direct reports he was meeting with. And so I prepared him. So what we did was I grounded him, which means we did a bit of breathing. I welcomed him into the space. And then I took him into the moments before the meeting mm -hmm. with his direct report, gave him the scene and said to him, this is the scene. You're going to be meeting them now. You want to empower them so that they can hold the space for their separate teams, because again, the yeah. wider team is 30 people. So I was empowering him of how he can empower and, and support actually his direct reports that they can now handle the scenario. So I prepared him and he's thinking how he would be before the meeting. Then he went into the meeting and I do this a lot. So I do this visualization preparation, which all sports people do. This, this is yeah. backed by neuroscience I see you smiling. Mm. So this is a classic where I coach anybody that coaches with me. I do this a lot. I do it if people, let's say, are, 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 are sitting with some fear around something, then I help them to let go of the fear and I put them into a space where they are not in fear. And so I make them, I, I make them <laughs> again and again replay a positive situation that, that actually when they're in it, mm. their brain remembers and so I really prepare, that's how I coach leaders, I prepare them to empower their teams, to support their teams when there is fear, hmm. and also to move into this, out of this, just me and my team space into what does the organization need for us? Hmm. And so when I'm coaching the leader, I'm not just coaching the leader, I'm thinking about his one-on-ones, his teams, I'm thinking of the business. And so I'm holding that act frame of all the three spheres at the same time. And I'm also challenging the leader that I'm coaching to do the same. So they learn to hold all three spheres. Sometimes you don't do it all simultaneously, but you zoom in and zoom out the whole time as a leader. I, I think I, I really like that because as 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 we've talked about before, as you know, and this is grounded in sports psychology, the brain does not tell the difference between fantasy and reality. And so when you're role playing, you know, before, during and after in the person, you, you create a cognitive map. And that cognitive map brings what? It brings a sense of control, brings a sense of certainty, because you're talking about questions, what they can do in this situation. How do you see creating this space for each of your employees such? And so when reality actually happens, well, the brain thinks, okay, I've been doing this. So there's that, that confidence, not overconfidence, but there's that confidence to move into that space and they perform at a lot better space, just like any athlete uh, uh, would. I'd just like to shift to your book. You said you co-authored a book in 2017 on mindfulness. Um, not so much about the book, because I think you've talked probably a lot around it, but what did you learn about yourself, Samantha? What was something significant that became a little bit of an eye-opener as you were scribing thought down onto page? Mm. It's a great question. I don't know if I'm actually going to answer you what you what you asked, but I, I'll, I'll share something, because I know a lot of people want to write books. I was really, really stressed during the time of writing the book and actually before. Mm -hmm. So I partnered with uh, this professor because he really challenged me to write the book. So he he came to visit for, um, he was a speaker at our conference. I was on the committee. And so uh, I landed up with him at the beach uh, together with his daughter, who I was awed around that he bought his five-year-old daughter you know, to this conference with him. I had a five-year-old at the time too. Mm. And so we went to the beach. It was in December. It was 22 degrees here in Israel. And so he was telling me about all these books that he'd written. And I'm thinking, oh, that's so nice. And then <laughs> I was telling him about my yeah. work. And then he said, you know, mindfulness is a really hot topic. Now, why don't you write a book? And I said, so he said, come on, I'll, I'll write the book with you. And I'm thinking, sure, sure. And he said, okay, let's just have a Skype call. At the time, Skype was big, right? Yeah. So I said, okay, I've got nothing to lose. Let me have a Skype call because I was really old. I mean, he's a professor, you know, and all he's got five degrees. So we hopped onto a Skype call, and he was, like, really serious around writing the book with me. 
And his methodology is that he's co-authored a lot of books. But then what happened to me is my integrity hit in because I thought, how am I going to write the book with, with Jonathan? Because he's not a mindfulness practitioner. He's a professor of psychology. Mm. And I'm the mindfulness practitioner. And it's not like he has this huge mindfulness practice. You know, no. he does a lot of things. How am I going to write the book with him? So I was highly stressed until what happened is, he did all the research on the mindfulness, which I don't know much about research. And then I actually wrote all the exercises that I've been practicing and getting all the, you know, these great, um, uh, you know, these great achievements and successes with my clients, you know, through workshops, through one-on-one. -on -one. And so he backed it all up by the neuroscience, which now I know so much more about the neuroscience since I've, you know, written the book with him. But the book actually challenged me to up my mindfulness practice. So not only was I sitting, I was doing yoga, I was journaling, I was doing all the practices that I was writing about. So I'm very pro Jason. If you are listening to this call, it's you be in your integrity, stop challenging yourself. So all of us practice mindfulness. If you're practicing yoga or Tai Chi, that's mindful movement. It's now time for you to up your game and so if you do want to be more resilient, if you want to be a better leader, find something else you can do. Maybe it takes you five minutes during your day. Listen to one of Jason's uh, podcasts. There are so many, so many gold nuggets in there. Find a practice and, and start adding on to what you're doing anyway. It doesn't have, it's not about the time. It's about the quality, first of all, that you're bringing into your moment. It's about your intention. It's about your own choice. And living fully every day from moment to moment, present, present in being present as much as you can and being really purposeful about your life, about your team, about your family, about your country, about your community and, you know, showing up fully every day. You know, the idea of writing a book when you were talking on that, on the sand, on that beach, you know, I don't think a lot of the questions sound like they would have come up without that opportunity, without that ex to move into that, right? Because then you had to start asking yourself a lot of hard questions, right? And those questions allowed you to follow a road to have a much more deeper sense of what you do, or as you said, to up your game. But it was only through that, that dialogue with that professor that it allowed you. And so I always like asking authors what they learned about themselves. Maybe it's through the process of writing the book or transcribing thoughts down into concrete words. Mm -hmm. There's always something there. I find it one of the more fascinating questions I like to ask authors such as yourself. Um, Samantha, I am very appreciative of the time and very respectful of your time. We've been speaking for <laughs> a good while now. Is there anything you would like to share in the idea, in the sense of ideas or suggestions with my listeners that maybe something we haven't touched upon? I think less is more. That's also a mindfulness practice because you do need to slow down to speed up. Mm. Um, in order to be mindful, you do need to slow down a bit. And um, so don't think that if you slow down, you're going to do less. You're actually going to do so much more. I think that... Finding the right partner often helps. Like you see people go jogging together. Uh, you and I are doing this podcast together. So if it's hard for you to find something to do alone, find somebody to do something with you. Find like, you know, as I say, a coach. Find somebody that resonates with you and up your game because you will feel so much better. And not only will you feel better, you will you have such an impact on every single interaction of the per people that you meet with, whether you're a parent, whether you're a brother or sister, or, you know, anyone that meets with you, you have the opportunity to bring more light into the world. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in fear, you'll bring more darkness into the world. And so now more than ever, Ever, humanity needs us. We need to bring more light into the world. We need to show up and everybody from their place. And so I do think we all need to personally grow and see how we can do that. And it can be 30 second exercise, minute exercise, but don't stop there. Then, you know, increase that, increase that 
and and just don't stop just you know see how you can uh, you know shine more light i like that shine more light because we need that right now Samantha Amit, thank you very much for joining me on It's an Inside Job today. It was a brilliant and eye-opening discussion. I want to acknowledge you for all the work you're doing. No, I know in a that. lot of the work we do, a lot of the time, you know, the listeners will listen to you and they'll never contact you, but they actually mm. listen to you. And that's what a lot of my clients tell me, that they, you know, the stuff that we talk about, it mm. stays with them for life. You know, it's your voice is in their heads and guiding them. And so less questions and more appreciation. Thanks for that. Thank you, Jason. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've also learned so much through you. You know, this insightful conversation with Samantha reminds me that mindfulness is not just a practice, but it's a tool, it's a vehicle to help us build resilience, equanimity, and a profound sense of well-being. You know, in the ever-shifting landscape of our minds and the myriad changes we face, mindfulness emerges as a steadfast companion. It empowers us to navigate the complexities of life with clarity and more purpose. Through cultivating present moment awareness, we develop the resilience to weather storms and the equanimity to face each situation with a balanced mind. Now, of course, mindfulness is not a panacea that promises perpetual happiness or a shield against life's difficulty. Instead, it invites us to meet ourselves where we are, acknowledging the full spectrum of our experiences with compassion. It serves as a guiding light, a waypoint, helping us to regulate our responses and to choose intentional actions. Well, folks, I hope you learned as much as I did in that brilliant conversation with Samantha. And a personal thank you to you, Samantha, from me. I appreciate your time and your sharing your knowledge, especially considering things that are going on in Israel at the moment. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, folks, if any of you are interested in taking Mindfulness, the online digital course that Samantha has developed and curated, I will leave all that contact information in the show notes. Well, folks, that brings us to the tail end of another show. Here we are at the finishing line. Well, until next week, when we are at the starting line again with a new interesting guest, keep well, keep strong, and we'll speak soon.